In the last book, we were introduced to the Mornival, how annoying Abaddon is, how grand Loken and Horus are, and how the Crusade is hitting a few speed bumps. Peace talks with an advanced race called the Interrex have been sabotaged, and Horus is starting to feel the strain of being Warmaster. Okay, in we go, book two, False Gods. The fleet is on the way to Davin to deal with Temba, who turned rebel and gave the Emperor, and more importantly Horus, a big Astartes middle finger. We see the Remembrancer data slate that reads your frontal lobes and a crystal nib pen writes it out. Seems like an unnecessary step. Why not just transcribe straight to the slate? But I guess the pen takes a step away from anything resembling AI. A nice physical thing doing the work, not some hidden and unseen dreadful spirit. You see someone just sitting here and the tablet is auto-populating? AI, burn that heretic. The unfortunate possession of Dubal is still rolling around and troubling everyone who was there. It's eerie that it's extended well beyond just a hard fight to bring down a beastie and then to have it arise again and be put down for good. Everyone knows there was something supernatural here. There's a whiff of self-aggrandizement in the newly named Sons of Horus. But your Primarch is literally called the War Master and is the head of the entire crusade. I think a little pomp is permitted. Because of this name change, Loken is repainting his entire suit of armor from white to green. But then for those of us who collect the models, who've painted whole armies, so we don't want to hear no complaining from you, Logan, son. And we want parade ready, not just battle ready. Don't skimp on the null oil or the highlights. You are Astartes. I want to see dry brushing and blending at the very least for the Emperor. Then we cut to Malakurst, who I feel bad for. Malakurst is Horus's equerry, who is too messed up to fight, but not messed up enough to be a dreadnought. Weak. Anyway, he's all worried about bringing Horus this data slate. I was getting really nervous that it was going to be another terror is doubling taxes on this world that we've just incorporated flawlessly without a drop of blood spilled, and this is just gonna cause resentment and rebellion, and once again, we have to bring out the bolters and subjugate the population. But no, it's just some poxy remembrance of Toph who has pulled some strings with the Sigilite to allow her to document the War Master. Hardly the biggest burden for Horus having some journalist tell you for a bit. And if she does become his personal scribe, will she accidentally document his turn to chaos? Like, you can literally flick back through the books like we can with this Horus Heresy saga and drop a finger down and go, there, that was the start of it, that was the moment. And is it going to be quick? Like, there's Horus's daily schedule written down. Get milk, do dry cleaning, turn to chaos, kill dad. Or is it going to be slow and subtle? So there's a big meeting in a yurt, everyone is there, a bunch of titan drivers who got the lion's share of the attention in the fight against the mega arachnid. Hmm, my socks are still firmly on there. The mega arachnid had no ranged weapons and you were in titans, just stomping and blasting. Woo hoo. Squashing bugs and swatting flies. Were you ever in the remotest jeopardy from these things? I think not. No kudos for you. Euphrates is waiting to see the War Master, and Carcassy is staring down her cleavage, because in the grim dark of the far future, there is only war. Ooh, hello, boobs. But much to his regret, he is clearly in the friend zone. Anyways, the word bearers show up, and Carcassy is disapproving of their emblems because it is emblematic of a time when humans burned books and feared knowledge. <clears throat> okay, Carcassy, keep that mouth shut. 
Last time, you got a damn near fatal kicking from Imperial Guard for such talk. And I think Astartes might take that kick in to apocalyptic new levels of hitherto unseen ass kicking if you try it here, mate. But Carcassy has a nice mischief aside, trying to squeeze some heretical things and wry observations into his work to see what he can get past the prying eyes of the censors. He's been sponsored and needs to be a good boy, but he still wants to see what he can get away with. I like this dude. The discussion after the yurt meeting. Loken is getting spooked because he's reading books again, and there's a section that details events very similar to the Jubal possession. Are we all vulnerable to this? If it happened to these guys and it happened to us, the Astartes, what chance has humanity got? But then he's set straight, because the people he's reading about lacked a certain something, i.e. the Emperor, and he should have faith that his awesomeness can handle it. Other races have run into chaos and been found wanting, but they lacked a mega psychic immortal giant looking out for them, standing against it. Anyways, Horus is not taking the botched opportunity to incorporate the Interrex very well. He is spending more and more time alone, only seeing Erebus. But that is also coming to an end, because the word bearers are heading down to Davin. When the Emperor left the Primarchs to it, and went back to Terra, they felt deserted, alone, isolated. And it's weird that Horus is doing the same to the Mornival. They are isolated, missing their head honcho, the conversations, the camaraderie. But when he emerges, it's to, guys, quit it with the kneeling, I'm not the Emperor. <laughs> then we have a fun interaction as that little twerp Abaddon tries to kill Carcassy. And Loken, who is a fraction of his size and strength, steps in to block him and gets tossed aside, but then totally cows him, demanding answers. And we find out that Abaddon didn't let Erebus into the lodge and give him a little coin. It was Erebus who brought all of them into the lodge. So Erebus is a word bearer. So is he using the lodges as a cover to spread his faith in the Emperor? And if that faith is going to get corrupted to chaos, will that be how the heresy spreads through the Lodge system? Okay, I guess time will tell on that one. Abaddon's temper is getting more and more out of control, and everyone knows it. Well, do something about it. Yeesh, don't they have an Adeptus HR in the Imperium of Man or something? Anyways, to the sparring place. I like the setting on the training machines. Maximum lethality. Just before the simulation begins, there's a grand moment where Loken looks at him, at Erebus, first chaplain of the word bearers. Liar. <laughs> Loken is in the sparring chamber, getting stuck in. Mercedes is watching him train. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. Ooh, hello, beefcake. Anyways, he takes a cut and Abaddon shows up and you know what? I don't care what else he does, what evil he commits, what planets he slams a Blackstone Fortress into, being snooty and pissy with Mercedy did it for me. Okay, mister, can't pick a damn hairstyle, baldy or top knot. You were an annoying, thuggish little bitch in Horus Rising, but now you're an annoying, pissy little bitch in this one as well, and you're ragging on a character I really like. Of course, Loken being the, well, I won't say better man, let's just, let's just stick with him being the only man in the room. And he brushes it off. They talk about retirement for Loken once the crusade is over, but Loken's optimism isn't up to it, and he thinks it's never gonna end. I'd have to agree, it's very Dune. The Empire would be like the spice, the most valuable commodity in the galaxy and the never-ending fight to defend it. Even once united, internal rebellion, and Xenos, and chaos, it'd never end. Afterwards, Loken is talking to Erebus about chaos, and he's all, no, 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 it's just mindless churning energy. Yeah, the thing that took over Jubal definitely had purpose and definitely had a fun time doing it, and cheeriness in doing it denotes consciousness, or at least some sort of drive, so okay. I thought they were more aware that there were entities within the warp at this stage of the game. 
it wasn't that you need a Geller field to just stop the energies destroying the ship. But I guess not. They apparently are completely ignorant as to any intelligence in there. Erebus dismisses the writings Loke and his check-in about the monsters and the demons and the possessions and the dark gods. It's just fanciful writers doing their fanciful things. There's a deleted scene in the film Dogma where Azrael is explaining to Bethany about how bad hell is, how it used to be just the absence of God, but then humans started cooking up their stories of lava and torture and monsters and hot pokers in the butt, and because of all those beliefs, hell became, well, actually, let me see if I can find it and I'll add it right now. Human, have you ever been to hell? I think not. Did you know that once hell was nothing more than the absence of God? And if he'd ever been in his presence, then you'd realize that's punishment enough. But then your kind came along and made it so much worse. So I wonder if there was a period where the warp was as Erebus suggests, and as humans evolved and self-awareness arose, and then they started dying and moving across, and their emotions started churning it, influencing it, like like-minded souls merged, and that's where we get all the Chaos God stuff. Anyways, I haven't got that deep into the lore yet, so I'm sure we'll find out. Anyways, Erebus. But I'm your brother. I wouldn't lie to you. Yeah, evidence says different, and thou art full of it, Erebus. So Erebus says when the Interrex accused us of stealing the blah 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 whatever blade from the Hall of Munitions. Excuse me? What did you just say? Erebus just gave the name of the weapon that was stolen from the Interrex without having been told it. Not even the War Master said what it was called. Okay, I was wrong. I stand corrected. It was Erebus that nicked the weapon and not Abaddon. But I'm not taking back that Abaddon is still a little punk though. But why the hell did the word bearers sabotage the talks? Did they just want the blade? Is this like the Mechanicum and the STCs and the Dark Angels and the Fallen? It's their thing. They'll violate any oath or any order when it comes to getting their thing. I mean, Erebus says the Interrex warrior Loken was chatting to was corrupted and consorted with Xenos and wasn't his brother like he is, but it feels like Erebus is just trying to cover up his slip as quickly as possible here. Unless, of course, it's part of some overarching plan I haven't seen yet. So, the personal reporter Petronella turns up with her bodyguard. And yep, she's a toff. She chats with Horus and is all eager to document the glory of war and all that. And Horus sets her straight. It very much reminds me of the very last acting lines that Alan Rickman ever said before his death. Never tell a soldier that he does not know the cost of war. As they are preparing for the attack on Davin, everyone is double and triple checking their war gear because no one wants to perish from something as trivial as mechanical failure. Maybe that connects to the reverence the Astartes have in tending their weapons and equipment because, well, I'm effectively immortal, immune to sickness and disease and even headaches and hangovers. I have speed and strength and all these gifts, and for certain it will get cut short in the service of the Emperor. So let's go ahead and make sure it's a good out and not, oh, I forgot to tighten that bolt and didn't, and I, f oh dear, my grav chute failed. Oh fiddlesticks, I was hoping for a better death than this. Splat. And once again, Abaddon the Thug comes out to play. One of the Astartes is stating that this ain't some Xenos race or petulant offshoot of humanity that doesn't want to be unified. We're going to war with our own. But no, they're traitors. Abaddon wants smash. Don't tell me that. It get in the way of Abaddon do smash. Reasons hurt Abaddon brain. He just wants smash. Jesus, this guy's a psychopath. They need to rein this idiot in. Can't someone just go, hey, Abaddon, there's a traitor in this airlock, and he just called you a nonce. Flush! <laughs> and another bit of foreshadowing. These guys are Imperials, and they rebelled. But what if others rebel? And what if Astartes rebel? You talk crazy. Such a thing could never happen. La la la. 
But for saying that, we're going to report you for sedition to the War Master. And Loken freaks out, and they all go, eh, gotcha. They ran this same nasty prank in the death of Stalin. I'm going to have to report this conversation. Threatening to do harm or obstruct any member of the Presidium in the process of looking at your fucking face. <laughs> You balls like Kremlin dogs. Be serious. Again, my only gripe is maybe a female voice actor for the female roles. Because this dude has all the voices for all the various dudes. You can instantly tell Loken from Horus, from Abaddon, from Carcassy, from Aximand, but there's only one female voice. And the scene as we now have three main characters that are female, for example, they're about to launch, and a female starts talking. I thought it was Mercedy, but nope, turns out it was Euphrates. A teeny tiny mule, but eh, it's my only one, so there it is. As the forces are coming down, there's something on the box, and you need to listen to it. Oh, not the Samus thing. Come on, anything but the Samus thing. But nope, it was something else entirely. Anyways, the troops tool up, and they begin the attack. They land in a huge, icky swamp, and are immediately up to their ears in zombies that used to be the Imperial Guard. There's plenty of gross Nurgle descriptions of goo and pus spattering things, and even some plague bearers in there. No Nurglings though, which is a shame, they're kinda cute. Horus makes for Temba's fallen battleship, fights his way to the bridge of the ship, and faces off against Temba, who of course is all mutated and grim. It's a tough fight, and Horus sustains some grievous injuries, but does take Temba out, at which point the influence of Chaos vanishes, and he is returned to normal. He's all sad and sorry, turns out the Imperials were offered glimpses of the power of the warp, and decided, ah, let's give it a go, and the malevolent presence took them over. Horus tells him he is mistaken. The warp is power, but not sentience. Temba tells him he's wrong, and that only through Horus being strong can they stop the grim dark future where there is only war. Seeing as that's the tagline for the game, pretty sure he's not going to pull this off. Horus is really upset, and then collapses, freaking everybody out. The rich chick dives in and tries to help, and this breaks everyone out of their stunned state, and they call in the apothecaries, who all fail. Up on the ship, Everyone is losing it when they hear that the War Master is dead. Once again, they have created a religion out of the Crusade, and with the Messiah dead, everyone goes mental. It also proves Loken and the others wise when they told Horus not to go down there in the first place, because what will happen to the Crusade if he gets killed? Well, now we're seeing firsthand that he should have stayed put. The Mournaval arrive back on the Vengeful Spirit and seek to unload the War Master and get him to medical. The Astartes go juggernaut through the crowd and it's a literal slaughter. More than 20 people die and many more are brutally injured as the Space Marines ignore the screams and just plow a path through the people. This horrifies Carcassi. Mercedy starts walking amongst the wounded and I thought she was going to help out. But no, she just starts handing out the God Emperor is your pal pamphlets. The War Master is dead. Everything's ruined. Oh wait, look, he's still alive. And oh, ouch, the Astartes just tore me apart. I'm lying here with my guts hanging out. Oh, here comes someone to help me with a pamphlet. Oh, that's great. I'll just stuff it in the hole to try and plug it up. A bandage or some morphine would have been more welcome, my dear. So they just can't stop the War Master's decline. Abaddon blubs like a little wimp and then gets angry with the apothecaries telling them if, that if they fail to save the War Master, he'll kill them all. Yawn. It's interesting that they are in the dark about the War Master's anatomy. The Astartes are to him as humans are to the Astartes. So what does that mean? That only the Emperor could really be the medic for the Primarchs? That seems a little short-sighted. Now, we discover that the reason the War Master is circling the drain is because Temba's blade poisoned him. And not just any poison, one that is Primarch specific. A Primarch killing poison. Okay, now this is getting troubling. 
Erebus deliberately goaded the War Master into going in person onto the planet, where there was the colossal ambush. The treason of Temba is the only thing that was personal enough of an insult of such intensity that could have got Horus to brush off concerns as to his safety and settle this matter in person. Temba was possessed and was used as a lure and he had a Primark killing poison ready to go. Hey, what a quinky dink. Does Erebus want Horus dead to take his place? What's the reasoning here? Anyways, Loken decides to go back down to the surface to get the blade so they can analyze the poison. The Remembrancer Petronella ends up at Horus's bedside and he blabs everything about himself to her. Can't see this coming back to haunt him. Oh, and look, the blade is the one that went missing from the Interex Arsenal Museum, the living blade that can kill whatever it focuses on. Erebus manages to convince a few of the Mornival that the Temple of the Serpent Lodge is the only way to save the War Master. Sure, it's a religion and superstition, but with the inevitable looming, what have we got to lose? When you are doomed, give anything a shot. Look, Lister, I agree. It's a stupid idea. It almost certainly won't work. But the very worst that can happen, the absolute bottom line, is that you'll have to spend the rest of your life as a mindless gibbering vegetable. <laughs> But the rest of your life's only going to be 30 seconds. What the hell? When Loken turns up and discovers them standing outside while the War Master is locked inside and they're waiting to see if he will be healed or die and be cremated here. Loken is dead set against this magic stuff, but the others won't budge, so he storms off. Erebus is running this cult meeting and gets his throat cut. Not sure what's going on here, but I guess we'll find out. Now, Magnus the Red, still miffed about his exploration of psychic powers being frowned upon so much, uses his powers and rustles up a ritual to get a warning to Horus before Erebus gets into the warp and messes with him. Using images of wolves, he tries to remind the War Master of who he is, but then Erebus appears, posing as someone Horus loves and trusts, Sejanus emissary and best bud of his that was murdered at the start of Horus Rising. So there's this image of the Primarchs and the Emperor being worshipped as gods. Everyone venerates them, but old Horus isn't there. He suddenly gets all envious and resentful. Dude, I've been running this whole crusade. I'm the War Master. I don't make the cut for being worshipped. What the hell? So Erebus, in his Sejanus suit, tries to get Horus to swallow that the whole crusade, the whole entire thing, is just a sham, so that the Emperor can get more and more powerful, and as soon as he achieves godhood, screw you guys, I'm a god, I'm going home to the warp. Becoming a god is all that the Emperor has been after, and everyone is expendable. And to be ditched when he gets what he wants, yeah, doesn't sound good. Then... They're in the chamber where the Primarchs were grown, and it's pretty defensible. It's almost inconceivable that anything could get in here and scatter the infant Primarchs. So it had to have been done on purpose. Maybe this lends credence to that story that it was the female perpetual Erda, the woman who was as much their mother as the Emperor was their father. She didn't want them turned into what the Emperor intended, weapons to be blunted and then dumped, and then scattered them to protect them from this fate. So maybe the Sejanus suit isn't that far off of the mark. Back on the ship, the Imperial Army are really showing themselves to be bullies and jerks, as they again go after Carcassi and Euphrates. Is it because when it comes to war, you're the bottom of the barrel, the cannon fodder, the meat fed into the grinder against Tyranid, Orc and Eldar? So when on board with civilians and you're mopping the floor with a skinny girl and her tubby friend, you get to go, yeah, this is what it must feel like to be a Hyrodule. Okay, back to Horus. Not sure if I'm buying it. He always believed his past was his own, but now it's been undone by the words of this one dude. Centuries of being with the Emperor just unraveled in a conversation with a ghost. It seems to be taking most of the truth and just twisting it a little to shake Horus's foundation. 
but he seems to be swallowing it all rather quickly. Hey, Sejanus, how's it going? I thought you were dead, old friend. Yep, pretty much. How's things with you? Eh, I think I might be dead as well. Got poisoned. Bummer. Oh, guess what? The Emperor betrayed you and is going to ditch you and the whole Imperium to become a god. That's bitch! And then Magnus shows up and drops the big reveal. This is not Sejanus. And Horus goes, yeah, I know. Well, duh. Then why are you so quick? So quick to eat this titanic mound of bullshit? Anyways, then there's a nice fake out. Carcassy goes back to his quarters. He opens the door. The place is in complete disarray. What, like it's been searched and there's someone waiting to ambush him? Nah, it's always like this. Despite his own, by his own making, he's a slob who hates housekeeping. I like when Horus makes the journey from the incubator chamber to the planet on which he was dumped, and the ruinous powers show him a glimpse of the future. Oh, the legions diminished, bureaucrats running everything into the ground, fear and superstition, Xenos threatening humanity from every side. Yes, because of you, you fuck! If you hadn't heresied up, none of this would have happened! This is your fault! This is the future you cause! So Cinderman goes to Euphrates because he's intrigued by the faith that she's been spreading. She thinks she's in trouble, but actually he knows that with science killing God, humanity will go down with that loss. And so he's actually down to the worship of the Emperor as a God. If Lorgar was admonished for worshipping the Emperor as a God, well maybe he knew something. Something humanity wasn't ready for, and he wants to find out the truth. Undeniable proof of the Emperor's divinity from an iterator would legitimize it and spread it across the entire Imperium. If what they saw at the Whisperheads was an evil like no other that humanity is currently ignorant of, then more than ever we need a divine being to unite behind. And so who better than the Emperor? Personally, I think he gets off on giving awesome speeches, and in a religious context, you get a lot more reaction from the crowd than an Imperial TED talk. They check Erebus's noodle tattoos, and Euphrates gets a composite image of them, and hits print, which helps Cinderman translate this book, which turns out to be the Book of Lorgar. Then, we get one of the first Pray the Pain Away Sisters of Battle moments when the iterator Cinderman accidentally summons a demon from the book, as you do. And she presents the Imperial Eagle, renders herself immune to waves of lethal fire, and then banishes it. She drops into a coma right after. So, Horus is there with Magnus, who completely fails to smite the psychic hell out of Erebus because he is too far away. And it's a case of, okay, Horus, whom do you believe? And Horus just says he's chosen, and that's that. The temple doors open, and Horus comes strolling out, elating everyone, because turns out tens of thousands have surrounded the temple, waiting to see the result. So, off to a new advanced civilization, the Orishan Technocracy, and they are dead chuffed to see the Crusade fleet, having not realized they were not alone. They are very similar to humanity. Even their power armor looks Astartes-like, having used some of the same STCs as the Imperium. Angron and the World Eaters translate in, and six hours later, it's all out war. Hmm. Peace is going well. Angron arrives. Six hours later, everything goes tits up and it's war. I wonder if there's a connection there somewhere. I'm picking up your sarcasm. Well, I should hope so, because I'm laying it on pretty thick. So, Loken provides a flashback to the meeting that represents everything the Crusade is trying to do. Lost Brothers United. The technocracy have human-machine hybrid stuff, so of course, the Mechanicum amongst them immediately get a huge boner. Talks are going well, and then the War Master draws his pistol and blows the lead dude's head off. Mercedy reiterates that yes, he had a staff energy weapon that was going to kill the War Master, and when he failed to assassinate Horus, all of the Brotherhood of Elite backing him up attacked. 
but Loken tells her there was no weapon and the Brotherhood were all unarmed. Their bolters didn't have magazines. The Astartes were definitely not unarmed, and as they tried to just flee, the Sons of Horus massacred the lot of them. Mercedes just doesn't get why the War Master flat out killed the Consul. Neither does Loken. But then he saw the War Master smile after the massacre. I don't know why, Horus now wants war. At the next lodge meeting, the lads all want Carcassi killed for the stuff he's writing and spreading through the fleet the tells of the Astartes butchering the civilians on the embarkation deck when they brought the War Master back. And now they want also to frame Loken for it. Terek tells them this is nuts, that they are way out of line and that the War Master will hear of this. And then they truth bomb his ass by saying that this is the War Master's idea. So as Petronilla tries to flesh out the War Master's deathbed confession with some Astartes input, she fails to get through to anyone. But her bodyguard, the mute Magard, who had distinguished himself in the Nurgle Swamp at the start as kind of an awesome warrior, so she gets him to hang out with the Astartes and she'll just download his memories when he gets back. She says it's because she's a woman, but I think more accurately it's because she hasn't killed anyone. So Magard gets to go to a lodge meeting with Horus there, and he gets everyone to pledge allegiance to something. To something. He's not saying what, but he wants everyone ready to stand with him. Like mindless chumps, they all chant allegiance. And then he confirms that he wants Petronella dead and Carcassi dead as well. So they go down to finish the technocracy and Angron and his boys show up to lead the way and get a mountain dropped on them. A wholesale slaughter ensues. Loken tries to deactivate it and a surrender occurs. But then Mr. Red and Moody explodes from the rubble and just starts shredding everyone. Dude, you missed the fight because you didn't see the foe dropping a mountain on you. Suck it up. Plus, there's a contradiction here. Apparently, the butcher's nails can indeed be removed. He just doesn't want them removed. Other stuff I've read says that even the best of the Imperium couldn't remove them without killing him. Which one is it? Then, a bit that really pissed me off. When Horus kills his own remembrancer, Petronella. I know he wants to stop what she knows reaching the public, but... Maybe you should have kept your big fat mouth shut, Horus, and not blubbed your guts out to her on your deathbed. There's a classic scene from Angels with Dirty Faces. At the fatal stroke of 11 p.m., Rocky was led through the little green door of death. No sooner had he entered the death chamber than he tore himself from the guard's grasp, flung himself on the floor screaming for mercy. And as they dragged him to the electric chair, Claude Wiley, the concrete floor with agonized shrieks. In contrast to his former heroics, Rocky Sullivan died a car. Dude, you're the war master. Don't die yeller. Cagney faked being scared to stop the kids idolizing him and going down his gangster path. You are the war master. Stay strong, be an inspiration, and with your last breath mutter, for the Emperor or something, wimp. Magard the Mute as well, you treasonous git. Not only letting your charge be killed, but you also take it out on carcassy. Really, the Lodge was just so awesome, you forsake all allegiances a moment later. Mind you, Horus was there, and we've seen so many times how his mere presence is just charisma galore. Horus flat out says he's going to lead a rebellion against the Emperor and it's because of his plans for Godhood and then F the Imperium after that. And he buys off the Mechanicus with a, you know those STCs you basically adore as the holiest of holies? Well, a certain technocracy has a few and they're yours if you uh, pledge allegiance to me. And just like that, Mars is on his side. Oh, and just so you know, if you want to get into all that forbidden stuff the Emperor put on the blacklist, you can give that a little look as well. And that's Martian Allegiance rock solid. I wonder if that's how Magnus is going to get turned. 
Hey, Red, wanna betray the Emperor? Never. I am loyal unto death. You can get into all the Psyker stuff and secrets and magics if you do. Well, if you put it like that, death to the false emperor! And as I said in Horus Rising, I knew that the lodge system contributed to the rot, but didn't really know much more than that. I didn't know it was so deliberate to purposefully send out representatives to the other chapters and introduce the lodge system and then use that to slowly influence and convince people to back Horus, expose them to Horus's new truth. And they start setting up the loyal Primarchs to be taken out. Okay, now I'm wavering again. You want to replace the Emperor who's going to ditch us all for godhood. Fine but waste half of your brothers as well? I don't think it's to save the Imperium. I think he's basically pulling a Walter Merrick. I really want to be in charge. Okay. Good. Oh, and turns out they killed Varvarus, the dude who wanted the Space Marines held to account who slaughtered all of those innocent civilians just because they were in the way. What a surprise. During Angron's pissy fit, he takes a bolt round straight to the chest. Hmm. And then, here we go. Basically the equivalent in a World War II movie where we are, where are we being sent? To Normandy. Credits. Or where are we being stationed? Hiroshima. Credits. Where are we going? The Istvan system. Wow. I was just amazed at how I went from Horus rules to fuck that guy in the space of two books. I know there's contributing factors here, that each Primarch personifies an aspect of the Emperor, and Horus is his ambition. So, okay, that's a dangerous arrow to let fly. The ruinous powers are, well, ruinous. And with Horus on the verge of death, it shouldn't be too much of a problem for the Chaos Gods to jam a few needles into his defenses and get him to question things and some resentment, and then use his ambition as a lens in order to taint him. And finally, the resentment of having been left to the crusade by the Emperor, and having the last few attempts at reintegrating lost civilizations being a total disaster, except that he actually caused the last one. Anyway, that seemed to really bother him. And this makes him see a certain futility in this task bequeathed him by the Emperor. Okay. Let's see where this goes in the next one. The subtly titled Galaxy in Flames. <laughs>